From Boca Raton, Florida, this is Behind the Bima. On this episode, Rabbi Goldberg and co-host Rabbi Philip Moskowitz and Rabbi Josh Brody are joined by Dr. Yehuda Savina. From his early dreams as a young Garrett Husson of becoming a pediatrician to his current role as a military doctor in the IDF, Dr. Savina's story exemplifies the essence of dedication to both his faith and his nation. Join the rabbis as they delve into the life of a man who, through his myriad experiences from the corridors of Schneider Children's Medical Center to the battlegrounds of Gaza, showcases the incredible strength found in the unity of purpose and the power of dreams. Also, a discussion about Purim. What's an appropriate costume this year? All this and more, Behind the Bima. Welcome back, Behind the Bima. Behind the Bima, together with my dear friends and colleagues, we are whole and complete when we are together. Rabbi Philip Moskowitz and Rabbi Josh Brody. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being together. We have an incredible guest tonight, Dr. Yehuda Sabiner, probably maybe the only person, certainly now, maybe in history, who checks off all the boxes that he does. Gera Chassid, Technion graduate, medical doctor, IDF officer, father of special needs. He's just an extraordinary person, checks off so many boxes and really, really inspiring. And we're excited to bring the conversation that we had with him together to you. Rabbi Moskowitz, Rabbi Brody, what is going on? We have Perm coming up, and um, obviously Perm this year is a little bit different. It's a little bit uh, complicated. Our hearts and minds right. are in Israel, and uh, you had a fascinating off the record. We have something after Shul every Shabbos, which is called off the record, and there was a discussion this week about what are proper costumes. Do you want to take our listeners behind the bima into that discussion, and perhaps maybe there was a disagreement amongst the rabbis on this uh podcast about that well off the record is you know we take subjects that there are multiple perspectives of not one uh, not one authoritative truth and we offer different insights or perspectives and let people share and debate it, it's become an incredible incredible slot i think it was your idea Rabbi Moskowitz. sort of a, a sit down kiddish a quick l'chaim we take a topic we keep it strict to 20 minutes after 20 minutes we call it that's it we want to be on time we want to keep it um, and we take topics so this week i pose the question that there's a general question of should we change the way we observe Purim this year with a crisis and a war raging our brothers and sisters on a front line? How could we do business as usual? So how should Purim look this year? Which is a general question. But the more specific question was, maybe in other years, kids or adults wear IDF uniform as a costume. On the one hand, are we identifying with by wearing the costume? Are we saying that IDF soldiers are our heroes? This is who we dress up as, not Superman and Batman, not LeBron or Kobe. Our superhero are the members of the IDF. Or might it signal something insensitive? Could those in Israel who have a husband, who have a son, who have a brother, who themselves are serving in the army say, oh, that's cute. You're wearing a costume. You get to take it off at the end of Purim. We have to wear it because we're fighting on a front line. It's not something that should be worn as a, as a costume. So maybe there's multiple per- perspectives of it. And I'm not even expressing what my definitive opinion is. I would just say that it shouldn't be viewed from our perspective in Chutz Laaretz. The question is, when people will post pictures about their Purim, how will someone in Israel interpret it? If it gives them chizik, that's amazing. They're wearing... They're wearing IDF uniforms. They're wearing IDF uh, swag, IDF. That gives us chizik, then great, we should do it. If someone might feel that's sort of insensitive, it's not a costume, Don't you know? You have the luxury of taking it off and, and we or the people we love have to wear it to go fight and risk their lives. So that, that was the question of it. Now, I wasn't there this week, um, but you know, obviously, oftentimes there's a very dynamic debate back and forth. What were some of the arguments in favor? What was the arguments against? And usually like the conversation moves in one direction, which way without you expressing your opinion, percentage wise, 70, 30, 60, 40, where was the conversation moving on job this morning? Well, we'll hand it off to Ray Brody because he was one of the people with a strong opinion. What was interesting to me was that it wasn't something I, I anticipate, but because my, I myself feel like it's a good question. Wow. I could hear both sides. Most of the people who had an opinion thought there is only one opinion. Right. Now that you would say that might be true every week, and that might be true of every <laughs> topic in the Jewish world, right? That's the stereotype. That's the joke. Um, but I was surprised by how, for some, this was the most obvious thing in the world, and there yeah. is no other side, even if they were on different sides of this. So, for example, Rabbi Brody, what's your I, opinion? See, I think what happened there. That's an example. Again, I don't know psychology or, or, or how this all works. But when someone gives one opinion and, and frames it in a certain way, it's hard for everyone else to go against that one opinion. I'll explain what I mean. I basically oh, set it up in a way where I said, listen, 
No one's doing this to make fun of the Israeli soldiers. There's something called Purim. And if you don't dress up, then you're not really celebrating Purim. So your one choice is you can go and you can dress like Batman or Superman. And I think that's insensitive. And if you want to show that you really do care about the army, then you're going to show the kids that this is our, who, who our heroes are. This is who we dress up as. I think the problem there is that then it kind of set it up that if you don't agree with that, then you, then maybe you're not a fan of the army. So I don't know. Maybe that's what happened. So a lot, of people agreed just... with, a lot of people agreed with Rabbi Brody in that. And, and then some others had some nuance, which was interesting, that said kids should dress up. Kids who wouldn't qualify to be in the army right now, if they wear a uniform, they're showing these are their superheroes. But adults who would be in the army if they were in Israel shouldn't wear it as a costume when they're not. That was a nuanced view that maybe it depends on the age. Rabbi Ari Leibowitz, our dear friend, put out an article quoting Rav Schechter, I think, saying not to wear uniforms in America because with anti-Semitism spiking, not only issues of sensitivity to those in Israel, but we don't want to make it look like we're warmongers or that somehow, you know, we're celebrating, which I, I don't know that I agree with that perspective because I think we don't want to... We don't want to abstain from wearing that to suggest that they in Israel are, right? We're we're defending the Jewish people. They're defending the Jewish people and entirely morally in the right and nothing to be apologetic for. Anyway, it's it's, it's an area, it's a topic, and, and every week we try to come up with one where there's multiple ways of looking at it. And hopefully we're all learning to realize that there are multiple ways and to respect different perspectives and approaches to it. I was going to say that that to me is the best part because usually when you – you know, you'll text out or we'll discuss what the topic's going to be before Shabbos. And usually it's a topic that you and I have debated during the week. So I know where you stand. You know where I stand. The fact checker is has, uh, you know, weighed in on the situation as well. Um, and, but usually I have like my way of viewing it. And it's fascinating to come to these conversations and to realize that not only are there two sides, but there could be 40 sides to something. Because as you just said, right. within any topic, there's an enormous amount of nuance and to see what people get passionate about, to see how people approach topics differently, it really is a, a, a really beautiful display of how to agree and disagree agreeably. And to watch people debate conversations back and forth, all moderated by the rabbis, is really a special experience. All well, with some challenge. It got shut down pretty quickly because what happened was there was a guest here this Shabbos who's here for a business conference, a woman from Beit Shemesh. She says, hi, I'm visiting from Beit Shemesh. My son's in Gaza. And he would love it if you all wore yeah. IDF uniform. <laughs> That's the only one that matters. And then, so no, we were all like, next topic. Next no, they were like, let, let, make sure we're going to do it. And we're going to send the group photo and the whole shul wearing IDF. Exactly. We're like, <laughs> she shut it down pretty quickly. Um, I, I'll tell you, I'm a high percent. We're all high percent. The Rabbi Brody has, has children in the army uh, who've served in the army. So certainly his, his, his opinion carries a lot of weight. I'm hypersensitive. My siblings who have children in the army. I just, and, and I was in Israel again last week. And, and sometimes the people in America who don't mean malice or harm, who go on a yeshiva week vacation somewhere, not Israel, and they're posting pictures, or they're posting a birthday party, or they're posting uh, the dessert they made, they're posting, I don't know, their kid's dirty diaper, and, and they're, not, they're not doing anything intentionally wrong or, or trying to be insensitive. But if you're in Israel where your life right now is so wrapped up and intertwined in this war, and it should be even if you're not in Israel, you, you just interpret everything that's posted through that prism. And I just think that we should all be living with that consciousness, that sensitivity, asking ourselves, these aren't ordinary times. So maybe ordinarily, even ordinarily, I don't believe in or encourage or enjoy the people posting all those things. But, but certainly in these times, how will it be seen and perceived by somebody in Israel while they're going through what they're going through? And I think that's a good question to generally ask ourselves. But but that woman from Beit Shemesh shut it down, so we pivoted quickly to another question, which I'll ask you. So I went to Israel last week, and I went to the airport with a couple chevra, and two of us have TSA pre-check, and one did not. So we check in, and having gone to Israel several times, Baruch Hashem, thank you, El Al, going several times gets certain status, and I was able to help them with that. But now it's time to go through security, Miami Airport, which is a zoo, and English is like the third language. Anyway, so two of us have TSA pre-check, and one does not. So our first reaction was, we're all in it together. All for one, one for all. No man gets left behind. Then we get to where you should go in to get on the TSA the line. Line's a mile and the line. line. The line's like a, a mile, mile and a half long. Yeah. See we're you like, later. nope, no man gets yeah. left behind. So we stood with him for about 60 seconds. And the other person and I look at each other. And we're like, yeah, we're out of here. And we tell the third person, we love you. We'll see you on the other side. So that was another off the record dilemma. Mm. Do you leave someone behind if they don't have the TSA pre-check? What's the right, what's the courtesy? What's the right thing to the do? The courtesy is, is, you know, like 
you got to get him pre-check. Like you got to hit him over the head and be like, buddy, it's 2024. Get, get pre-check. I would leave him. I would, I would admit it. No, I don't, I didn't leave him. I did this on this last trip. I stayed with him and I'll tell you why I, 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 first of all, the the last trip, that one was me and you made me buy clear on the spot. Otherwise you were leaving (laughs) me. No, it was actually this other trip that I was there. And I had to take a, 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 what do you call it? Like a holster, not a holster, a magazine for a gun. So then I, I didn't, I ended up not taking it through TSA and they said, that's a good thing. But then when I asked them, even I said, is it okay to bring it? They're like, of course you can't bring it. But then they flagged all my luggage as though I'm carrying stuff, which I didn't even have. But the problem is I would say it depends if it's a person, let's not say your wife or your, someone in your family, but let's just say people close to you where you've said, listen, you got to go get it. And it's on them. They're being lazy about it. I don't have time to get it. I'm like, get then you leave them. Then you leave them. You right. say, I so gave you opportunity. Clear, you would leave your wife in the line. Yeah, she has it. She happens to have pre-check and clear and everything. But I would, because and then I said, because some, some of my kids. ever yeah. gone through pre-check with your wife? Yeah. And told your, yeah. Your Whoever. Kid, sort if, of, if you, guess, if I've game. said, I will take you, I will get the appointment. I'll pay the hundred bucks, whatever it is for five years. And now yeah, I'm too busy. I, I got too many things. Then you You're stay in the line. Own. You're on your own. But if it's a friend, it's one of the guys. Okay, we'll stay. as extra. I, I got to wait for you anyway on the other side. I just want to say that in November, when Rabbi Brody, Rabbi Gibber, and I went for a fantastic trip, the three of us, and it was really, really amazing. We got to the airport in Miami, and Rabbi Gibber and Rabbi Brody had clear and I at TSA. And then the TSA line was forever. And the two of them were like, sayonara, see ya. If you want to join us, you better sign up for clear right now on the spot. Remember that. Which yeah. I did, and now I have yeah. clear. Yeah, it's All good. It's worth it. They would have left me behind. <laughs> anyway, it's an interesting dilemma. But this, is big, this is very big. Hold on one second. I think we have to bring back something we haven't had in a long time. Yeah, so we ready? need some music. We need... Wow, we're, we're bringing back behind the Vima breaking news. It's been a very, <laughs> very long time since we did that because the long awaited raffle drawing is going to happen right now. We ran our BRS Global campaign. And we set a goal this year of $200,000, which was an ambitious, ambitious, ambitious goal. It blew through our previous goals. And in a difficult year, it was a definitely ambitious goal. And I'm proud to say that as of this moment, our goal of $200,000, we are at $218,524, 109% of our goal, 956 supporters. So we have almost the same amount of global members as we have physical members and represent our, our primary community, our local community, which is our central community, our core community, our beloved community, but also our, our greater global community. We're so grateful. Thank you for enabling things like Behind the Beam, our Shirem, our articles, and, and so much more. And we, we gave a little motivation this year, Rabbi Moskowitz. What was the motivation? We are hosting, if you haven't heard yet, Ishai Rebo for now, not one, because one concert sold out within hours. We are hosting two concerts on April 7th, and the incentive was this year, if you gave... Um, towards our global campaign, you would be entered into a raffle. And the raffle winner not just gets to come to the concert, because that's, I think, like the icing on the cake. The real cake is, is we're going to fly you down. You're going to spend Shabbos at BRS. You're going to get to hang out with Rabbi Goldberg and Rabbi Brody. And it's going to be an epic experience. Can we bring them on the Bema, like behind the Bema? (laughs) That'd be very funny, by the way. Right. (laughs) Wild. Okay. Go for it. So we're going to do the raffle. Are you ready? I'm ready. Ready to rock and roll. It's exciting. Hold on. Let's see if we can do this. Hold on. Can I do this? Come hang out on the Bema behind the Bema. We did it. We did it in preparation. No, I know we did. No, I was trying to do something else right now. Oh, here we go. Yeah, are we ready? We got Yishai in the middle. Are we ready for the big reveal? This is it. Okay. I'm nervous. I'm a little bit nervous. Hold on, Rabbi Moskowitz. I can't stop it. We're doing it. (laughs) You said this is legit. This is legit. Legit. Every Every name is on there. Everyone wow, this is there. exciting. Randomized, computerized. I wonder if we get a, we're going to know the people. This is it. <laughs> Who is it? Whoa. Anita Adler. Well, and the I guess Anita's is, not going to be sitting on a beam. The winner like, is uh, Anita Adler. Mazel tov. You have won two Mazel domestic tov. tickets any, from anywhere in the United States to South Florida to VIP tickets to Isharibo at BRS, and we are super excited. Rabbi Moskowitz, can you still get tickets to that first show at Yishai Ribo? 
First show, 8 o'clock, is completely sold out, but we opened up a second <laughs> show, 5 p.m., limited number of seats. Uh, even that, I'm, I'm amazed at how fast it's selling out. Limited number of seats. The whole back section is already sold out. There's like two seats in the back, and then in the front section, you have a limited number of seats, a few VIP seats available, but I'm telling you, if you're sitting on this one and you're like, oh, I'm going to wake up in a week and get the tickets then, there ain't going to be nothing left. And all those emails that I'm getting, Rabbi, can you please squeeze me in? Uh, yeah. when, when they're gone, they're gone. The so time. I would get in now. Unbelievable. Thank you for all your hard work on that. All the money from the Shea concert going to Israel. We're not uh, trying to do a fundraiser locally for ourselves from that. We have our, our global campaign and our shul dinner at Capital. We have enough things, but we want to continue to help Israel. That's what we that's what we live for right now. And all of the all the proceeds of that concert, um, you know, with our wonderful partner helping Israel fund and Glenn Galash are gonna go to Israel. We're really excited. So thank you for your leadership on that. And uh Dr. Yehuda Sabin are amazing, amazing person. I'll just say this. You're going to travel anywhere in the world with Rabbi Brody. You better go out and get your TSA right now. Because <laughs> if you could get it and you don't have it, he is leaving you behind. So if you plan on joining Rabbi Brody on any of his missions anywhere, you better go out and get better have it. your it's clear, you pre get it right now. global, get it now. <laughs> Without any further ado, Dr. Yehuda Sabiner. It's a tremendous host, a great pleasure to be joined by Dr. Yehuda Sabiner. Dr. Sabiner, Dr. Yehuda, you are, as you know, very unusual for the combination of the parts of your personality, of your career, of your own history. Growing up a Ger Chassid, growing up in Ger, a graduate of Technion, a noted pediatrician serving in Snyder's Pediatric Hospital. We'll talk about how you were instrumental in guiding Poskim during uh, Corona, during covid uh, a member of the IDF, Mazal Tov recently became an officer in the IDF and called up as a reservist in this war. It's a rare combination of so many parts of who you are, which make this conversation really, really exciting. And we thank you for spending some time with us. Thank you very much, uh, Robert Goldberg. Um, as I say, I think maybe the story is not usual, but I'm a normal guy. <laughs> <laughs> a normal guy. We'll see. We'll see at the end of this conversation. Take us, and I'm tempted to fast forward to being in the army today, the IDF, this war very much on all of our minds, obviously uh, praying and davening and, and doing all that we can to be united as a people. But let's go all the way back because when you were growing up, a Gera Chassid, you probably didn't see yourself going to Technion or serving in the IDF. So tell us about that childhood in Ger. Was your family always Ger Hasidim? Do you go back to Ger in Poland? Or is this new to be among the Ger Hasidim in Eretz Yisrael growing up? What was it like growing up in the in the courtyard, in the Chatzar of, of Ger? Um, so i coming from a very traditional Ger family. Um, my grand-grandfather was already in the days of the Sfatim at uh, Shliach Tzibor uh, for Yomim Noiroim uh, in the Shul of the Sfatimet, the Holy Sfatimet. And then uh, another uh, um, grandfather of me and grand-grandfather of me also was a uh, ballet at Fila in Yomim Noiroim in Gur. So pretty much very normal uh, Gary family. Um, I was I was uh, growing up in the Ger uh neighborhood in Arnof, Jerusalem. Very pretty much normal childhood of every any other uh, Hasidic child. And what what is it about Ger that stands out? For those who don't know, Baruch Hashem, we have so many different types of of Hasidus, from Lubavitch and Satmar and Vizhnitz, and I don't even want to start to list all of them. So what makes Ger stand out? What was it that Ger tried to impress upon you through the Chinuch, the education system of Ger, through going up in a community of Ger, that the Ger Rebbes themselves, what, what do you think distinguishes Ger? So might be today, you know, people will not recognize the, the path of Ger, but I think as I got it from my parents and from my grandparents, Ger was a place of excellence in anything they did, especially learning Torah and Iyun, and very devoted, you know, to, to get achievements also in, uh, in the Gashmiyut and also in Rochaniyut. Everything they did, they tried to do the best mm. in Yiddishkeit, in learning and helping each other and working. Um, I think this is the impression that I grew up as a child. Mm. And did at what point did you realize that while you wanted to remain and stay true to being a Ger but you wanted to broaden a little bit and maybe pursue medicine, education, 
when did you know that and and, and how did you pursue that so i never saw conflict uh between those two things um as a child the first memory I think um, about me wa wanting to be a doctor was in age uh, three or four. I had very special pediatricians in Jerusalem, yeah. um, Dr. David Matar and Dr. Dave, um, and Dr. Jacob Shapira. One is Harvard gra graduate and one is uh, Yeshiva University graduate. And they both was very special doctors, not only in meaning of a professional doctors, but also as being a very compassionate, very manchist, you know, very humbled and age four max, I already asked Dr. Shapira what I have to do to be a doctor. I really yeah. saw myself uh, going in his uh, footsteps. And when you said that to him, did he say, no, listen, that's, that's nice, but, but stay in the yeshiva. It's not for you. Or did they say, no, it's a good thing. Go and explore. I just said he was a beautiful guy. <laughs> so you can imagine what was his answer. He, he, uh, he told me then in those uh, days it's it's a possible to do it you know when you grow up I don't see any reason you shouldn't be a doctor um, and I was a dreamer o already then I didn't saw you know the practical problems as a, a kid that didn't got any uh, secular education to do it but I, I, I had to face it later in the path but um, as a child I, I had a dream I had the agreement of uh, my my doctor that it's a, it, that it is a possible and you know just waited to do to accomplish it. So, what were some of those challenges you referenced? Obviously, you didn't grow up with a heavy secular education. Um, how did you overcome that? Was it just pure ambition? You wanted to do it, and did you encounter any challenges as you progressed through the system, whether within Gear, outside of Gear, people who weren't. Um, exposed necessarily to this type of Hasidus who may have viewed you as an outsider? What were some of the challenges that you encountered along the way? So obviously the challenges were, were huge, okay? My English my English is thanks to my mother that spoke with me in English, but I didn't know ABC uh, reading or, or writing in age 21 when I finished my uh, my traditional education. Um, math, even the little stuff material that they studied in the cheder until age 13, the one hour a day, I was uh, asked my parents, I wasn't, I was not an easy kid. So it, even those uh, few words and the few um, um, material in math, I didn't add uh, the background. So it was a huge um, um, challenge to get, uh, to minimize the gap and to get uh, good enough marks. And to start the, the journey in age 21, uh, if you're asking me what is the secret, I think it's just pure stupidity. I didn't uh, calculate how difficult it's going to be. You know, I just went like a semi-trailer uh, on full gas, full power, and did it every day. I had to think what I'm doing today to get my uh, dream um, um, getting true. And in the beginning, it, it was a... Uh, Complete disaster, complete uh, failure. Um, first semester, I got 43 in math. Obviously, 43 out of 100 will not get you um, to a medical school. Um, but with very hard work, um, exercising, um, you know, until four o'clock in the morning, um, in, with word, uh, very hard work, in two years, I was able uh, to get very good marks and to get ac accepted to one of the best. Um, uh, medical schools in the world. Hold on. So, Dr. Yuda, let's, let's slow down. You're 21 years old. Were you married at this point? Yeah. What age were you married? A little bit before 21. It was, uh, I, I started um, the, the Mechina, the pre-academic program, um, eight months after marriage. So you got married when, when you were, I don't know in Gare how long you date. Did you date? Was it a Basho? <laughs> was it a Shula? Well, how, how long did you date? <laughs> It was a one day, one day, um, one meeting in the morning for an hour and a half, and one meeting, one meeting afternoon, um, hour and three quarters of the hour, and and the end of when the did day you, when did you break the news? When did you break the news you want to be a doctor in the morning date or the afternoon date? <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> you didn't. <laughs> you didn't. So it, it was funny. I I told my. I told my father before I got uh, before we went to the meeting to the date. I told him that 
I know what they're going to tell about me. I know which uh, data they collected about me. They probably heard, you know, a very good uh, student in yeshiva, one of the best uh, Hasidic yeshivas, a uh, great dying for the future. Uh, I don't want to be so much uh, as a crook, so let your father know that I am not promising uh, that I will be, uh, that I'm going to sit and learn uh, un until the last day of my, my life. Um, that, that, I think that was my uh, <laughs> announcement. So you did, you did a little bit in the morning, a little bit in the afternoon, and uh, you're ready to, to get married. So, and now you're married. So you're married at 20, and at 21 you say to her, I've been learning in Yeshiva, I've been learning in Kailul, and I'm ready. I'd like to go get a little bit of a secular education. So, so it was a little bit different. It was a little bit different. It was uh, in the end of the pregnant, uh, it, it, in the eight months, it was the end of the first uh, pregnancy of our uh, oldest daughter. And we sh my wife had some complications, so we went to the emergency room. Um, those days, it was uh, the days of the strike, the big strike of the residents, the resident doctors. And one of the doctors had a sign on his back, a big sign, I am working by force. <laughs> they tried to fire them and court got everybody to work back. And he had a very big sign on his back that he's working by four. <coughs> and after two hours of waiting to get to the appointment to, of the doctor, we went in his uh, clinic in his room. Um, and I told him I was, uh, as I said, stupid and young. And I told him I would give my right hand and I will work um, to the rest of my life without salary, just you know, to sit on your chair and being a doctor. So how can you uh, go with a sign that you're working by force? Um, this guy was a very nice guy. He didn't, he didn't kick me out of the room. And he told me, if you want to do it, why, you're, why are you um, just, you know, go follow your dreams. Um, and then it's funny that you should mention that because there's something I wanted to tell you, honey. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> and then the night, that. my wife asked me, "What was, what was there in the room in the examining room?" I said, uh, "Oh, this is, was my original dream. I wanted to be a doctor." She said, "No, you wanted to be Rabbi Wozner. You wanted <laughs> to be a lion." I said, "No." <laughs> um, I, that was a very, very devastating. Um, introduction to this uh, dream. Um, it was unpleasant at all. I gave her my word that I will not do anything that she's not uh, willing to or she's not agreeing 100% on, on it. And the next day she came to me and she said, I am not going to be the one that uh, destroying your dreams. Hmm. Um, go to a rabbi that is uh, that we both are um, connected to him. And we rely on them. If he is going to give you the permission, we're going to go even to Australia if this is the, the way that you have to get accepted to medical school. Can you tell, us, you, can you tell us which rabbi you want to? I, I don't want to, to destroy his career. <laughs> <laughs> but the rabbi told you that you could pursue your dreams. So how do you go from a yeshiva background with no secular education to getting into college? Not only that I can pursue the dream, he told me also that if I'm doing it, I should do it as a religious mission. He said, you know, this uh, Olam Hazeh, by our mythology, is standing on three beams. Torah, Vodah, and Milut Chasidim. Pick up your beam. If you are not um, successful enough in Torah, go for Chesed, but do it as a, as a religious mission. And two, two weeks later, I started my pre-academic program. Wow. Can I ask you a question, Bait? You said your wife, she said she wanted to think about it and she told you the next day. Do you think part of the, the, the what, what she was thinking about is, I might want you to go, I might want you to pursue your dream, but there's so much pressure from the community? Or is it, no, she just, she really wanted just to figure this out. This is you and her, regardless of what the community is going to say, I got to make sure that I'm good with it. Um, I'm going to tell you the answer that I think I've, felt the same also 13 years ago. Um, right. My wife, not only that she's a hero, she's a very true lady, very, very, very true with herself. And she went already in those days, she was um, finishing her degree in architect. She wanted to support and to work and to give salary and the Kemach 
for Bait Shel Torah. This is how she saw her mission in this world. Having a husband, Talmud Chacham, a Dayan, maybe a rabbi, and she's standing and taking care of about all the rest. So it was very true of herself. Not, she, she never thought about, uh, you know, the community and what uh, different people are going to say. It was a very deep um, point with herself that she had to come by and to say, um, this is also part of the Ju Judaism. Right. So you, you do the pre-academic, the machina, then you get into uh, Technion and it's not an easy place to go. Yeah. Technion is a, <laughs> it's a tough place to go, um, but also, you know, full of pride. You know, we have in our, um, in our medical school, we have two medals of uh, Nobel Prizes. It's a tough place, but they're getting you very much um, ready to the clinic world and to research and to think, you know, never get to, you know, the truth as a Torah Sinai. Always you can question they they learning you how to question everything. Did you get? Uh, Sorry, go ahead. No, no, you go. Yeah. Did you get pushback from the community at all from from Gare when you came home, when you were at your parents' siblings? Was anyone like Yehuda? What happened? You were on your way to be a Dayan, and we don't we don't go there. I mean, I can't imagine a lot of Gare Hasidim in Technion in medical school. Were, were people proud because they saw that you didn't compromise? Who you are in terms of being in a Yerush Shemaim and Eved Hashem, or did they give you pushback and criticism? Was it hard to navigate that? It's a good question, <laughs> but um, also it's a. Uh, it's you have to make you know the separation between the community and the individuals. I think the individuals of the community are very good people, and they were were very supportive and proud. Um, but in the beginning, I had a couple problems. Uh, let's not go into the details. Um, you know, to give, to be the advocate of the ex. So I would say that in those days, I had to show that I can go there and to stay as I am now. So maybe this is what they were scared in the beginning. So I want to pick up on that and something you mentioned earlier, because I think it's such an amazing and profound point, which is, there are many ways to serve Hashem. Some do it through Torah, some do it through Chesed, some do it through Avoda. And obviously, you know, the Rebbe who guided you was very insightful in helping you realize that no matter what profession you do, if you do it right and you do it L'Shem Shemayim and if you do to you know, bring Hashem into this world, so that's, the, that's what a Jew lives for. Um, I feel like it's a lesson that so many people need to learn in their own professional careers where they leave yeshiva and they say, okay, I'm done with yeshiva. Now I'm going to go make money and now I'm going to go to work. And I kind of left one of, side of me and now I'm going to do another side. Give us some examples of what that means in real life for you. Obviously, you, you, you live that every single day. So as a physician, as someone who's obviously in the workforce, what are some ways that you are Mekadi Shem Shemayim, that you do that chesed, that you make sure that you're still true to your upbringing and your community and the values that you hold so near and dear? Great, great, great line. Um, I will give one example, okay? Uh, being a resident in pediatrics in the best uh, pediatric hospital in Israel, it's not easy, okay? It's not romantic. When you're working from, uh, I mean, uh, 7 o'clock in the morning until 4 o'clock, it's nice. But when you're doing the shifts um, of 28 hours in a row, and sometimes you're not getting to eat or even not to go to the restroom, um, it's not romantic, it's exhausting, it's, it's, it's terrible, okay? But when you wake up in 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the room morning, and you're going to the operation room to help to resuscitate a newborn uh, infant that just, you know, went out and with not of the resuscitation, you're going to be dead or you're going to be um, very bad damaged, brain damaged, um, I remember myself definitely standing in those moments and setting and saying, wow, what a great privilege of um, saving a life <coughs> and making an impact. Wow. And when I know that this is also the values of my religious, of kol amatzil nefesh achat mi Yisrael kilu ki em olam ale, definitely if you are smart enough to bring this knowledge to your mind in three o'clock in the morning, it's gonna also going to help you 
to survive, you know, the, the daily work. Not only, you know, the, the thought about I left yeshiva, I left this medrash, you know, this is also the, the, was the old way of the Baal Shem Tov. And everything you do, you have to bring God inside. How did you know, why pediatrics? Of all the different specialties of medicine, how did you decide pediatrics? Um, it was not my first choice. In the uh. beginning, I thought I was going to be an internalist um, for adults. Um, but by the way, I don't know why, but by the way, I went to the, this field. You know, I think God guided me to the air. And when... Um, half a year after I started my residency, I got my special kids, uh, my special kid DT um, uh, that was um, diagnosed with Down syndrome and cardiac problems and full with medical issues. I got uh, to understand why I why I came to, to this field. I mean, wow. without being uh, without me being a pediatrician and, and one of the best uh, medical centers for pediatrics. The challenge probably probably were um, thousand times harder. Wow! So Hashem sort of steered you and opened that door that you'd need to be in. So your daughter, how old is your daughter today with Down syndrome? She's um, two and a half years old. Two and a half years old, and you said she has other me medical challenges also. And I know right. you've been involved in establishing a multidisciplinary medical center. This for is children. the vision now. So tell us about that. So I think, you know, um, that um, kids with Down syndrome, but probably also with other um, special needs, not only that they have the, the problems of, you know, the developing and et cetera, they also have a lot of times um, associate uh, medical uh, problems proper as cardiac problems. If we're gonna talk, if we're gonna talk about specific Down syndromes, um, 50% of them have uh, cardiac problems. Um, some of them have neurological problems, endocrinology, uh, hematology, etc. Um, ENT. And I, my wife found, found herself, you know, in Sunday going to that doctor and Monday going to the other doctor and Friday going to the different doctor. And, and it's a very big challenge to the parents. So I think if we can make in one place, um, multidisciplinary clinic you know that the parents coming to one stop station and they're getting all the services in one day um focused and the doctors that working in the clinic also fo focused to the specific problems of the down skid i mean the problems of ent of uh two and a half years old uh, down is not very precise and very similar to other kids on that uh same age so I think it's going to be a very big uh, sora for our parents. Where where is that center? What are you working on? I am working now in Schneider, and we we are just you know we trying. Um, me and my wife trying to figure out what what is going to be the right way to establish so, such a center, but we're going to find the place and the time. And bezrat Hashem, imir Hashem, we're going to do it. Tell tell us if I can, and, and you'll stop me, Doctor Yehuda, if, if you don't want to go this direction. But, you know, when you found out that your daughter had Down syndrome, as a religious person, as an Eved Hashem, how, how do you accept, how do you receive that news? You know, you spoke about her as a special gift. So obviously today you're able to feel that way. Did you always feel that way? Is it, is it hard to feel that way? What message do you have for, for others with a child with, with special needs or with, with disability? So I think I am a very realistic guy, okay? Very realistic person. And already in the, during the pregnancy, I told my wife, I feel she's going to change my career. I was very into ICU pediatrics, emergency pediatrics. And I told my wife, I have the feeling that she's going to change my uh, path in, inside the, the career. Right. Um, it was Shabbos morning. It was Shabbos morning. Um, we, I diagnosed during my, during me and my wife staying in home, I diagnosed some uh, gynecology, gynecological um, um, emergency problems. So we rushed to the hospital. 20, uh, 20 minutes later, she was um, um, rescued by C-section. And when the attending doctor came to me and told me, 
some of the people think that might be that she has a Down syndrome. I felt like a car in a highway in Germany and 250 kilometers per mile and someone is is picking up the unbreaks you know in one moment. I didn't feel I didn't felt any negative uh, emotions but I felt you know all my dreams just collapsed in one minute. Uh, I, I had the, the thoughts you know that I will not be able to continue the residency, I will not be able to go to fellowship uh, abroad to specialize in fields. Um, but also in the same time, I felt very, very large emotions of positive emotions of love and care and responsibility. And this is the way we got her. This is totally the way we got her. And it was a mistake that we thought that she's going to, you know, destroy my career. It's not true. We can continue doing everything. Um, the only plus is that she brought, brought a lot of light inside our lives. Um, and I think, you know, this is the way um, today of God of um, changing things when he wants, you know, to ease um, the suffer um, from other people. He's taking someone that has the opportunity and the capability to change things and is giving them a child with uh, special needs. Look on Shalva, how they changed um, the, all the field of special needs in Israel. They became, I think, um, international known by um, very high excellence of uh, treating uh, special needs ki kids. Um, and you have these examples also in Israel with politicians, Yair Lapid, Tali Gottlieb, Doron Almog, um, people, you know, that in other fields, in other um, world, they were great generals or great politicians, and they're getting this special um, message from God, take this um, gift and change life for other people. Hmm. There's a beautiful video of you coming home from war. We'll get to in a moment the IDF, but the beautiful video in your uniform and the what has now become the classic song playing of being reunited and your your beautiful daughter running into your arms. It's such a beautiful video that it was retweeted. Which politician who who posted it? One of the a lot of them. <laughs> ah, I forgot which famous uh, Knesset member or which cabinet member. Somebody posted it, and I saw it went uh, somewhat viral from that. A really beautiful uh, video. Yeah, Rabbi Moskowitz. I was just going to pivot there because, as Rabbi Goldberg said at the beginning, you are a unique individual, both because of your medical career, but also because of your combat service in the reserves in the current war as a military doctor in a commando unit. Um, walk us through that. Walk us through the decision to join the IDF to give your services, not just in the hospital, but also in the field as well. And uh, certainly what your experiences have been post-October 7th. Um. So I can tell you that, you know, we're coming now, uh, we're entering the Purim days. Um, my favorite uh, my favorite uh, costume in Purim was uh, a soldier, an IDF soldier. Um, but I think, you know, as a Jew and as a doctor and as a person, um, I see other soldiers, how they risking their life and they're giving an open check to the nation to the brothers of sisters. And in the place, you know, of the digits in the check, there is not only the lives that they're risking, but also the businesses that they're risking. I had, in my team, I had a commander, um, the commander of my specific team was, uh, is owning a private um, winery. And he left everything in a very delicate uh, season, uh, time of the year. And he left everything and he came he, and he doesn't know if someone going to compensate him about it or not. So I think that when so many people are risking their life and their businesses and their families, um, if me as a doctor can give someone the guarantee that, uh, that we're going to do everything on the field, next to the scene, really next to the scene, not, wait, not waiting on the border to ensure that they have the best chance to come in one piece or to minimize the, the harm, during combat, I think this is my obligation to do it. But when did, when did you join? I mean, again, a Ger Chassid doctor. What was more startling to your wife? That you'd become a doctor or that you joined the IDF? I mean, I don't know which. We, marrying this Ger Dayan 
he becomes a doctor, and then he joins the IDF long before October 7th, right? So how did you first decide to join the IDF? And did you un- was there pushback or consequences to that decision? Obviously, my wife knew me better, you know, <laughs> when I joined the IDF than when I told her that I want to be a doctor. <laughs> um, but well, she, I'm in the doctor. told her you want to be a doctor. She knew you for two hours. So, yeah, it's hard. <laughs> she definitely knew you better. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm in the, in the army since the Corona time, pretty much. Um, I really wanted, you know, to give the hand also in that uh, place. Um, I didn't add in my dreams that I might be one day during inside combat, inside risking my life. Um, but I don't think it was a very great um, surprise to my wife. Huh. because she knew already, you know, to where it's going. And always she was also supportive, you know, when I gave her the, in, in the beginning, I wasn't in the, com- in the combat commando unit. I was um, in a special search and rescue unit. And the first months of the war, I was uh, in Ashkelon and the Kibbutzim. We had a couple of missions there, um, saving lives of civilians under fire, etc. And then a month afterwards, um, when I got um, the proposal from the commando unit, they told me that they looking for another doctor because they missing one doctor. So I asked my wife, um, I I have to go into come back to come back. You can say no, but you know, tell me what is your thoughts about it. And she said, um, she said again, you know, if you think this is the right thing to do, do it. Just promise me that you're coming back. <laughs> <laughs> She's a superior. Look, it's almost uh, half a year that I was out of house, um, disconnected from cell phones and technology. She wore it. She was here with four kids, handling everything alone. Um, at least two times hospitalization, hospitalizations of my special daughter. You know, she's dealing with it alone. Um, it wasn't easy. So I think. Really, the hard part of it was her part. Wow, you know, you mentioned earlier that you had these dreams when you were when you were uh, younger of maybe becoming a doctor. It takes a very special individual to become a doctor, and it's a special personality. You want to go there and you want to help, and maybe that's why you said it's not such a far jump to go from from being the 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 doctor in the hospital to being the doctor in the field. In our specific community, the community sent it um, us. Big Rosh Hashiva and uh, another very bright guy to study with my kid um, two times a week during the time that uh, the the period of time that I was inside Gaza. Um, in the classes, very extreme places, you know, of the mainstream. Um, they had my they had my name written on the board every day for the schut of me and the other soldiers. Um, my daughter came every sh- every Friday from school with a special letter, with a cheesecake from the teacher, with a chocolate bar from the teacher, having said to my kids and to my wife that we, they have ours in, in, in the prayers. And I think it has a lot to say about um, the perspective that the Haredi ultra-Orthodox community has about um, the great shlichut to be a protector for our brothers and sisters, not only, by the way, not only in Israel, I think every Jewish um, fellow in the world um, looks for us and, and, and the security of them are very much dependent also in the security of our homeland. Dr. Exactly. Sabina, can you, can you tell us more about what it's been like since October 7th, living, going in, you said six months, your wife has, you know, really had to, raise the children on her own heroically in and out of hospitals. What has been your experience in the army? Is there a a unity and appreciation in the army? Is there an appreciation that you're a Gera Chassid and here you are serving? In other words, for Gera Chassidim, it's unusual to go to the army. And for the army, it's unusual to have a Gera Chassid. So do you think you've been able to break down some barriers and heal some wounds and bring some some achtus, some unity? Because you haven't given up, you still have a beard and payas because you're still a Gera Chassid and you haven't compromised in that. Has that opened the door to be able to bring some some unity, some achtas? So, Rabbi Goldberg, I am not the only one, okay? Just in my family, I have a father that served in Zaka, and after October 7th, he was in Beri in Faraza. 
I have a brother, my young, not my youngest, but the brother after me that's serving in the Navy. Um, and we have also in, in the community of the Rosh Hashiva, we have another couple soldiers. Um, during war, it was, it's very hard to, it's very hard to express it by words. How special was it? Um, the unity. Um, we had people from all the rainbow colors of, of the society, of not only from Israel, also from the world, the Jewish world. We had two um, soldiers that came from Netherlands. We have a soldier that came from Canada. Um, and it was very special, very hard to express it uh, by words. Um, I think it was appreciated. And during, you know, extreme moments, you understand how much you are, you have, you have to have always your, your friend to look on yourself, to look behind um, your shoulder and his shoulder. Um, and we had a lot of trust and a lot of uh, respect to each other. I remember one Friday night, um, the first Friday night I was in Gaza. Um, I made Kiddush in the dark, you know, I thought, you know, I am the only religious guy. Why should I make uh, Kiddush uh, for everybody? If they want, they can do it by themselves. And then came the commander and he, he just was screaming and yelling, how dare you doing it alone in the side? Come and do it now again. Wow. Uh. Everybody. And after this uh, Kiddush, he told me, Dr. Sabiner, please uh, give a couple words about the Parsha. That I don't know what is the parasha, you know, <laughs> I'm disconnected. <laughs> no one next to me, a soldier, a very special soldier that got killed later, our medic, um, Elkanah Neulander, he told me it's Parshas Vayetze. And I remembered uh, Dvar Torah, that the Rosh Hashive, our Gerber Rosh Hashive said, probably when I was in age 14 or 15, and he said that in Parashat Vayetze, Please help me, Rabbi, if you can, you know, um, yeah. translate it. The sun's rested around his head. And then a pasuk later, a couple pasukim later, um, it said, It was a single stone. So how is it can be that Yaakov Avinu in the beginning got 12 stones and in the end he had a one stone? So what Rashi says there about the Medrash? They combined. They became Why? one. Because each one wanted the tzaddik to rest his head. Right. So they combined for one for one uh, stone. So Ooh. the Roshiva asked. <laughs> <laughs> the Roshiva asked, how, how is this a solution? I mean, be, instead of being now a fight between 12 stones, it's now a fight between millions of molecules and which molecule the the the, the tzaddik gonna put his head on okay and the answer was fascinating he said it didn't change in the in the practical meaning it changed in the mindset once you once you are one part one part in unity you don't care on who the tzaddik gonna put his head hmm. i mean um the right hand doesn't uh <coughs> Angry uh, is not angry on the left Hell. hand. Why you didn't do this or that? You understand that you're one organ and one thing. Oh. And I've saying those special words that I remembered from my rabbi inside Gaza, with such special friends that risking their life and taking care on my life and their lives for our brother and sisters. No one said a word, but I, and I didn't saw, you know, the reaction on, on our day faces because it was in totally dark. We were under threat of enemies, but I could feel the reaction in the, in the, you know, in the year. Hmm. You referenced the commander who was standing next to you, who uh, was ultimately killed, al Kiddush Hashem. Can you tell us a little bit Already. about him? Are you medic? Can you tell us a little bit about him? Our medic uh, named Elkanah Neulander um, was a young guy, 24 years old. We we celebrate is we celebrated together the team his birthday, a couple of days before he got killed. Um, he was a second year student in law school of Bar Ilan University, um, and he was um, very professional medic. 
we know we we were dear two doctors um and we always had a fight you know on which team is going to be i wanted to him to be in my specific team he wanted them to be on his specific team because he was that guy the kind of a guy that you know when he's in the field you can be quiet and everything is going to go you know as a switzerland uh watch it's gonna everything just gonna work um and he was also very great person of people he was a great friend and he always went, wanted to be the first and to risk his five his life for, for the first and i remember two weeks before he got killed um I told them maybe you're going back to law school you know you're still young yeah all your friends went back to to university and he said um after what I had went through in Barry it was on October 7th in Barry treating um dozens of of uh, civilians and soldiers and he said I'm not ready to go I am now in the war and I have to make my job um, also for the team but also for the nation and I'm not ready to do it and and it's very sad also now it's very hard to you know to recognize that such a precious guy and an excellent guy is not with us anymore it's mm, bad it's terrible Hashem you come damo it's Amen. just it's just absolutely absolutely heartbreaking Heartbreaking. Can you tell us more about since October 7th? I hope that the soldiers and you know that we in America, how much we love you, how appreciative we are of you, how much we've been davening and praying for you, how connected we feel with you. Um, anything more in terms of your experiences in Gaza and, and, and during this war for people to appreciate what our soldiers have been going through? Um, do you have, I'll ask you a little bit differently also. Do you, do you carry a, Do you carry a particular responsibility to make a Kiddush Hashem? Do you feel that because of your beard and payas, because you're a chassid in the IDF, that there are more eyes on you, that you're under a little bit of a microscope, and therefore you have to represent a whole community and you have to make a Kiddush Hashem? Obviously, the answer is yes. And not since I began, you know, uh, serving in the IDF also before. Also as a student, I don't think n- never... Ever, never some dean or vice dean of the medical school would know all the marks <laughs> of, a, of a specific student. But in my case, it was, you know, not only under microscope, it also was with, uh, you know, the Hubble te- telescope. Everyone knew everything about me. Right. Um, and, and it's also a very great responsibility, also in the work, also in the IDF, also in medical school. Um, yeah. You're really extraordinary, and I've learned so much from from listening to you. There's so many people that we interact with who, when they come in to touch with their dreams, with their goals, their aspirations, they they make excuses. They say, "I'm not smart enough, I'm not good enough, I'm not talented enough. I didn't have the education, I didn't have the background. You seem to have had this unique ability to put all those voices off to the side and to not just push through, but to blow through any barriers that have come in your way. What would your message be to anyone listening who has that voice in their head, who has a voice that says, I'm not good enough, I'm not strong enough, I'm not talented enough, I'm not smart enough, or I didn't have that background, and I've always wanted to do X, or I've always wanted to do Y. What would you tell that person to help them break through that barrier and accomplish their dreams and aspirations? Wow. As in all this uh, interview, always great questions, great questions. Um, so I think sometimes disability is ability, okay? The disability to, to think and to calculate all the consequences, um, what is the chances that I can minimize my gap? What is the chances that I'm going to be accepted to medical school? What is the chances that I'm going to be president of the United States? I don't care what. Um, sometimes the disability to see all the picture and just to do the right thing in that specific moment, this is the way how, how to get the big things done. And I'm going to say more. As a child, as I said in the beginning, um, I was a terrible kid. 
terrible kid. I mean, if you're going to give, if when, when in age uh, six or seven, you were, you were giving, you know, the word to my, to my mom that I'm going to be a good kid that, you know, will not go to prison and <laughs> have decent uh, marks and, you know, in etc. I think she would sign on the place that just give me that normal kid and, and I willing to, you know, uh, to continue in our life. But, you know, as I went forward in the, in the life and I, I got people that, were, that had to believe in me, um, if it, this is uh, teachers or my wife um, and my rabbi, um, you know, it got me on the right place. And, and obviously, a lot of Seattle is my, you know, none of this is, is normal. I don't think that none of the things that I went through in my life were, you know, accidentally. Hmm. It was someone was upstairs and hmm. switching the buttons, the, the buttons. <laughs> I have no other award for it. Are, are there other dreams that you have that you would like to achieve? You check, okay, doctor, medical school, you know, army, the, Family, we've done it. Like, what's next? Is there something else that you're thinking about, dreaming? Obviously, about? I have, but I am <laughs> not stupid. That it's not stupid now enough. To <laughs> <here. laughs> not going to announce it here. I'm behind the beamer. Breaking, breaking news. <laughs> The breaking news, the next dream. Dr. Sabina, you're close with the Gera Rosh Hashiva of Shaul Alter. Our community had the privilege of Shaul Alter. The Rosh Hashiva was here this year, here in Boca. We had a beautiful evening with him. And Baruch Hashem, each visit to Eretz Yisrael, we've had the privilege. Rabbi Brody and I were with him with a group of soldiers, and he was giving a bracha to the soldiers and giving them chizak. It was a very powerful meeting. Just last week we were back, and, and we had the chance to meet with him. What What is it? That, first of all, from what age were you close with the Rosh Hashiva? And, and what does the Rosh Hashiva's support mean to you? Um, well, so I know him since, since I know myself. Um, my father was very close with him. I remember the first big story that I remember with, remember with him was, um, I think, in age six or seven, um, when I got uh, banged in my, my forehead. I had to get, get to be stitched and... I didn't get the doctor to get to me. You know, I was very wild and scared. And my father asked me, what do you want? What do you want me to do? It has to be done. And I said, uh, I want to have a blessing of the Rosh Hashiva. That day he was the Rosh Hashiva of Ger. And he said, are you serious? 10 o'clock PM, I should call him. I said, if you're not calling him, I am not getting stitched. <laughs> so he gave him a call. And the Rosh Hashiva asked him, asked my father to give to give me to pass me the, the phone. And he told me, Yudale, um, your head is now open. A lot of Torah uh, went inside. So we have to tie it and to stitch it quickly. It shouldn't go, run away. Right, you now uh, agree to do it. I said, yes. And, I, you know, I just was laying on the bed like a good kid. And I gave the doctor to stitch me. Wow. Uh, um, but later in life, I got this uh, great support in all the things I did. Um, talking about my wife and the difficulties, you know, holding um, the house during war without the presence of the husband. Um, she got a lot of um, notes from him, chizuk and brachot. And... It's priceless. I, it's really um, not for granted, and and I am very very uh, thankful for God to to having uh, the the privilege to have such a guidance and such a rabbi in my life. What do you, what do you think makes? I, I know what I would answer, and I, I don't know him well enough. Bar Hashem, we're just beginning a relationship. What what do you think makes the Gera Rosh Hashiva so special? Of Shal Alter, he's a enormous Tamachacham, but there's something else. Uh, what, what what do you think that people should know that makes the Gera Rosh Hashiva such a special person? So I think some of the creatures, you know, it was, it just, he got it, you know, in birth, in birth. It just was a, some of this, you know, the, the special IQ and the special brightness and genius, etc. But I think the biggest part of him is the humbleness. Hmm. He's very, very humbled and always, you know, speaking to each other, to any person, 
free to poor, smart, stupid, uh, and then just the same attitude. Um, and this is a great humbleness, you know, that always I can pick up to the eyes who I am and to see guidance how to act in my private life. You've, you've interacted with several Gedol Israel, right? Because during Corona, as a pediatrician at the hospital, were you guiding some poskim in terms of how to make halachic decisions about Corona, COVID, or Zilberstein, others? Yeah, it was a special moment then. Um, I started my internship, not the residency, in Sheba Hospital. Um, and I, again... I was the third doctor in Israel that was inside the um, department of Corona. Um, and it was the day, those days was even before, even before we had um, true Corona COVID uh, patients in Israel. We didn't have any uh, serious patient in Israel, but we were elected to be the first um, um, reserve um, department for COVID. And I was exposed to a lot of, you know, the preparations of the nation, how to deal with it. And in one Shabbos uh, dinner, I told my family about what we're expecting, what disaster is going to come, etc. And the other day, my brother is calling me and he said, you know, one of the, I think is the, no one is the biggest, um, medical rabbi, no one in Israel, Rabbi Zilberstein, he gave up sack that didn't seem, you know, to have a lot of with my knowledge that I shared with them <coughs> in, in that Shabbat. And I got in con contact with him. I gave him the knowledge that I was exposed in inside the hospital in those days. And in two minutes, he stopped the conversation. He called his, his uh, secretary and he told him, Give the call now to the to the to the newspaper. They should not print the newspaper of tomorrow until I bring in a, a letter. It should be proposed in uh, published in in the first page. And he gave very very um, strong words about the sakanat nefashot and the pikuach nefesh and that we have to fulfill the the directions of the Ministry of Health. And in that time, when I saw the very extreme words that he picked up for it, I was, you know, I was scared for myself. I didn't saw any, we didn't have had in that point um, severe patients in Israel. So I told him, isn't it two strong words? And he said, if all the things you told me is true, this is what we're going to see. <laughs> and, and this is the biggest nest. I, I mean, how big can be a rabbi? Um, to have one sack, and then when he got the updated um, knowledge, to be humble enough and to take um, guarantee and responsibility about the other peoples, and and to do it in the front lines. So wow. this is unbelievable thing that I had the, the privilege to to experience from from very close. Hmm. Incredible. Incredible. Dr. Sabiner, you are extraordinary. We are, you're a gift to Am Yisrael. Thank you for sharing your story. I know you're also very humble and uh, and you definitely weren't eager to, to join us, but your willingness to, as part of your, your life of being a Kiddush Hashem, of being a Kiddush Hashem in these different ways. And uh, it's really tremendous. And uh, we thank you for your service as a Ben Torah, as an Eved Hashem, as a Chusid, as a doctor, as an officer in the IDF, you, you've sacrificed a lot. As an inspiration of a special needs child, all that you do. So thank you for spending time with us, and thank you for all the inspiration that you are. And Hashem should shower you only with bracha, and bring us all only besoros tovos. Amen. This was fantastic, and thank you. Really, really inspiring. And really we appreciate thank your you time. So much. And that you thank should you. be matzliach in everything that you're doing for Am Yisrael. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you. Thank you for watching Behind the Bima. Catch us next time for another peek behind the beamer.